In order to understand and make sense of the present, we have to study the past. One of the most fascinating topics for mankind is the origins of man. And what is the oldest civilization in the world? And what impact does it have on us to this very day? We are the first. The first to see the gods. The first to tame their beasts. The first to guard the soul from evil. That was a trailer of a video game titled Assassin's Creed Origins, due to have a worldwide release in October 2017. But Babylon, a kingdom that was once geographically situated in modern southern Iraq, is the oldest civilization in the world and not Egypt. And we will see from the most credible sources and the most trustworthy antiquarian scholars that this culture was the oldest that influenced the rest of the kingdoms of this world. They preserved their beliefs on small slender seals that were around the size of AA batteries with intricate detail. And they were like Bibles that were connected to chains that they wore around their necks. In the British Museum, the early Egyptians had slender seals. The early culture of Cyprus also had slender seals that dated to around 1500 BC. And the Medo-Persian Empire of the 5th to the 4th century BC also adopted these slender seals. One man knew the influence of the early Babylonian culture. He was a British politician who was a member of the Houses of Parliament. He had a desire to learn and was financed by the Royal Geographical Society to pursue his dreams and the British Museum to excavate the ruins in the Near East in Asia. He was also a British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire in Turkey where his bus once stood in the British Embassy in Ankara in Turkey, a gift to the Turks from his daughter. He wrote a number of books about his experiences, one of the most famous being his 1853 edition of Discoveries in the Ruins of Nineveh and Babylon, where he documented his travels in Armenia and Kurdistan. And this French-born British traveller of Huguenot descent, with a biblical worldview, this scholar, traveller, archaeologist, diplomat, cuneiformist and art historian, the Right Honourable Sir Austin Henry Layard, documented that the earliest culture was very highly advanced and succeeding cultures only adopted what was already in Babylon. Layard said that the engraved gems and cylinders discovered in the ruins bear ample witness to the skill of the Babylonian lapidaries. The origin of Assyrian architecture which I have elsewhere described was especially that of Babylon, for it was through Babylon that the arts appear to have penetrated partly, if not entirely, into Persia. With the glass bowls was discovered a rock crystal lens. Its properties could scarcely have been unknown to the Assyrians, and we have consequently the earliest specimen of a magnifying and burning glass. In the British Museum is housed the earliest known magnifying glass in the world that was excavated by Sir Austin Henry Layard and an artifact that has been attributed to modern times can be traced back to the earliest culture and the Babylonians had a very intricate knowledge of the heavens and named many of the stars and planets in space. Some of their discoveries are controversial. In the Pergamon Museum in Berlin in Germany in Western Europe, there is an artifact that is not on display for the public. On a recommendation, the narrator purchased a replica on eBay. It shows three figures in the center, but in between the two on the left at the top looks like a sun surrounded with more planets that modern science say is in our solar system. Others claim it is not the sun at all about the cluster of stars called Pleiades. The heated debate continues. 
But what has been credited to the modern world already existed in the ancient world? On one of the many campuses at the University of Oxford on the main road is a plaque with the name of two English scientists, Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, who made a microscope, though he was not the first. Others made contributions also to the lens. 13th century English philosopher and Franciscan friar Roger Bacon is usually credited with the invention of the magnifying glass. Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo Galilei built a telescope as a result of the introduction of the lens to Europe. And English scientist and mathematician Sir Isaac Newton, building upon Galileo's foundation, has helped modern astronomy. NASA, an independent agency of the executive branch of the US federal government, has made some recent discoveries of seven new planets with the technology they have in use today and all over the world. Different countries and astronomical organizations are building huge telescopes to get an even more in-depth look at space. But with all their breakthroughs and their development of previous discoveries, Layard's discoveries show that Babylon has the oldest telescope and they have the oldest preserved records of mapping out the heavens. During the Middle Ages it was generally taught that it was from this period onwards that true astronomy started to develop. But Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, named after the chief Roman and Italian god who was identical with the Greek god Zeus, was worshipped in Babylonian astronomy and named as Nibiru, which means crossing or point of transition, known as a star of Marduk. Its discovery was preserved in Babylonian tablets written in cuneiform, and its discovery has impressed modern science with the advanced science of ancient Babylon. The New York Times records the signs of modern astronomy seen in ancient Babylon. Fox News said that the Babylonians tracked Jupiter with fancy math. The independent newspaper said ancient Babylonians used early calculus to track the path of Jupiter. The BBC says ancient Babylonians were the first to use geometry. Nature magazine more or less records something similar. And ABC News said ancient Babylonian astronomers used calculus to find Jupiter 1,400 years before Europeans. But this wasn't the only Babylonian first. Half eight millennia ago, during the Renaissance, Luca Bartolomeo de Pacioli was an Italian mathematician and Franciscan friar. His fame has been eclipsed by his collaborator and contemporary Leonardo da Vinci, but he has been titled as the father of bookkeeping and accounting. But as the BBC recorded on the 12th of June 2017, it was actually the Babylonians who were the first accountants who preserved their records on their cuneiform tablets. Today, most of us have bank accounts in many of the central banks of our regions we live in, and we use them at will. And of all the institutions in the world, this is the one that we all are dependent upon. But who introduced modern banking? Most people have never heard of the Knights Templar, a religious order of the Catholic Church who were the number one soldiers during the Crusades. A book titled Rulers of Evil by the late F. Tapper Saucy, published in 1999, said that they introduced banking. But as it is an alternative view of history, it can fall into the category of conspiracy. In Chantry Lane in London's famous Square Mile, there is a pub called the Knights Templar, situated not too far from the banking centre of London. And off Chantry Lane is Fleet Street, and behind the main road is a church that was built by the Knights Templar almost 800 years ago, and it is still standing. In the courtyard is a column, and on top of it are the famous Knight Templar, the precursor to modern-day Freemasonry. And this building, consecrated in 1185 AD, was the original building, and the history in the book Rulers of Evil is now being confirmed. For in January 2017, the BBC confirmed 
that the warrior monks, the Knight Templars, did introduce modern banking into the West. But the article continues that it inherited from the Orient, the East, where the Chinese were the inventors of paper currency or flying money, who were the first to introduce it into the West via trade. But many in the financial and banking sector know that banking and our modern day financial system can be traced right back to Babylon, the cradle of civilization. Today, many libraries, particularly in the UK, are closing down. They say due to economic cuts, and they say you can get all your information online. But Babylon had the oldest libraries in the world, with a vast collection of topics ranging from all different studies. The Babylonians were also very skilled in the field of mathematics, and many of their complicated equations have been passed down to us. The Sumerian base 60 mathematical system is still used by us today, that is superior to the Roman decimal system that we use for geometry and modern timekeeping. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour is all from ancient Babylon. The Sumerian calendar we have inherited and still use it that consists of 24 hours in a day and 12 months in a year, 12 inches in a foot and a dozen as a unit. When the Babylonians calculated the cycle of the moon, we still have 12 inches on a ruler that represents 12 months in the year and 30 centimeters that represents 30 days in a month. The very word month comes from the word moon. The whole concept of spherical astronomy, as one book said, that includes the 360 degrees in a circle, the zenith, the horizon, the celestial axis, the poles, the ecliptic and the equinoxes have come down to us from Sumer or Shinar in ancient Babylon. But how did it get to us? In a well-researched book titled The History of the Persian Empire, probably the best study on the ancient Middle Persian Empire, the late little-known US Assyriologist and Near Eastern scholar Albert T. Olmsted, professor of Oriental History at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. Like the Assyrians in northern Iraq who learned from the southern neighbors and the Medo-Persians in Iran, the Hellenistic Greeks incorporated many of the mathematical principles of Babylonia into their culture. Pythagoras of Samos was an Ionian Greek philosopher, a mathematician and a scientist famous for the Pythagorean theorem. But as Olmes has said, his ideas were inherited from ancient Babylon, where this tablet that has been labelled as Plimpton 322 and dated to around 1800 BC has Pythagorean triples over a thousand years before Pythagoras. This clay tablet dated to around 1900 BC also shows the Pythagorean triangle that the Greek philosopher inherited and taught to his students. Anaximander was another Ionian Greek philosopher who lived around the same time as Pythagoras. Some say Pythagoras was one of his pupils. He incorporated the knowledge of the heavenly bodies, the sundial and the map of the earth into ancient Greece. And this artifact in the British Museum shows that the Babylonians were already mapping out the earth that he incorporated into the Greek culture. Anaximander's teacher, Thales of Miletus, has been described as the first Greek philosopher, who was the first Greek to inscribe a right angle triangle in a circle, determine the sun's course from solstice to solstice, and thereby fix the seasons. But as A.T. Olmes had said, he was preceded by the Babylonians. So the Greeks were not the first as one school teaches, neither did they steal it as another school teaches, but they inherited this knowledge and have passed it down to us. For the 17th century English Stuart monarch, King Charles II, set up an institution called the Royal Society that is based in London, England, to continue these studies and the development of science. Its official website says it has many of the world's scientists and is the oldest scientific academy in continuous existence. And in May 1974, it produced a document scientific astronomy in antiquity and confirmed in their research that 
it is finally argued that all subsequent varieties of scientific astronomy in the Hellenistic world, Greece, in India, in Islam, and in the West, if not indeed in all subsequent endeavour in the exact sciences, and listen to the language very carefully, depend upon Babylonian astronomy in decisive and fundamental ways. So our whole concept of modern maths comes from ancient Babylon, and we have inherited a old school of thinking. The 2003 invasion of Iraq, a continuation of the first invasion of the early 1990s, though absolutely disgusting, did highlight to us and confirm that the total destruction of Iraq's historic past is the destruction of the cradle of human civilization. But though Iraq is the cradle of civilization, who founded this first civilization on the earth? When we study history, we have to be very balanced and skillful in acquiring the right data and the many different ways at how we look at the past. Herodotus, the 5th century BC Greek historian, used a principle known as the method of investigation, where he travelled throughout North Africa in Egypt, Europe and in Asia, and collated data and arranged them into a chronological, historiographic narrative. His predecessor, Homer, famous for the Iliad and the Odyssey, written around the late 8th century or early 7th century BC, is famous for the oral tradition. Both methods are just as valid as each other and should be used together. The Sumerian king list in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford is a chronology of the earliest kings of ancient Babylon. Portions of it have been labelled as a myth, but to the ancient world their stories were historical fact. The ancients preserved their history through poetry and expressed it through dance. But we call it a myth because we don't appreciate how they documented their experience. This restaurant in Camden Market in northwest London is called the Gilgamesh, after the hero god on the Sumerian king list. It was the Telegraph newspaper who financed an expedition of the English Assyriologists to excavate the east where he discovered what has been labelled as the oldest literature on earth, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Who is Gilgamesh? Early Assyrian Babylonian art shows this god king, this mighty hunter, subduing a lion. Whoever he was, he left a mark on that Near Eastern culture. In the Greek or Roman world, their gods, like Hercules and Heracles, wore the cloak of the lion, and on the cylinder seals of Babylon, he is defeating the lion. He is also depicted on cylinder seals as subduing animals and wearing the horns of some wild goat or deer. And even on the early seals of Mohenjo-daro in ancient India, modern-day Pakistan, you have the same horn god subduing the animals. On a water basin from ancient Assyria are depictions of men wearing the attire of this deified individual, the fish mitre. Who was this man who the ancient world worshipped? According to Sir Austin Henry Layard, he said that Owens, or sacred manfish, who according to traditions preserved by Barossus, issued from the Eurythraean Sea, instructed the Chaldeans in all wisdom in these sciences and in the fine arts and was afterward worshipped as a god in the temples of Babylonia. It has been conjectured that this myth denotes the conquest of Chaldea at some remote and prehistoric period by a comparatively civilized nation coming in ships to the mouth of the Euphrates. The University of Oxford produced a brilliant scholar and historian whose older brother deciphered the Near Eastern script called Cuneiform that Layard excavated. He was also Bible-based in his worldview and he went into detail of who this civilized nation was whose leader taught the Chaldeans, according to the Chaldean priest Brosus. And in a book titled The Origin of Nations, published in 1877, the late George Rawlinson said that the descendants of Cush settled themselves in the country south and southeast of Egypt 
between the main stream of the Nile and the sea coast. Nimrod and his people, the conquering race which first set up a monarchy in Lower Mesopotamia and built or occupied the great cities of the alluvial plain, Babel or Babylon, Akkad, Erech or Ocho, and Kalna or Kalna were Cushites, a kindred race to the people of Ethiopia proper or the tract about the great Nile affluence. At the National Library of France, known as the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, or Paris, one of its former professors of archaeology validated the position of George Rawlinson. In a book titled Chaldean Magic, published in 1877, the 19th century French Assyriologist Francois de Normand, who also had a biblical view, said that to the Greeks, the name Cepheus was synonymous with Ethiopians. The opinion which has been preserved by Hellenicus counts them as one of the two elements of the race inhabiting the countries watered by the lower course of the Euphrates and Tigris. The famous Ethiopians or Cushites of Babylon, whose existence is proved by so many passages of classical antiquity and the sacred writings. The Bible connects with these Cushites the name of Nimrod, which is used both as a name of a hero and as a name of a place, like all those contained in the same chapter of Genesis. The Cushites founded the first political powers in Chaldea, the empire of Nimrod or the king of Cepheus, and there is no question of a Semitic invasion having supplanting them. When we look at ancient languages, the Babylonian had a cuneiform glyph or symbol for woman, which is called Sal. The Chinese symbol for woman, Nu, some linguists say is quite similar. And when you look at the Egyptian hieratic symbol for woman also, it also looks quite similar. Our modern alphabet in the West comes all the way from Babylon. And it has been proven that the earliest pictographic language can be traced all the way to Babylon. But today, languages are dying out all over the world. And it is estimated that by the end of the century, hundreds of languages will become extinct. But why are there so many languages in the first place? They came about as a result of Nimrod's rebellious scheme to unite the world against God and have faith in him, where God had to confuse the languages. And Flavius Josephus and his well-researched history said, that for the four sons of Ham, time has not at all hurt the name of Cush. For the Ethiopians, that is a Greek name word for black Africans, over whom he reigned are even at this day, both by themselves and by all men in Asia, called Cushites. But Nimrod, the son of Cush, stayed and tyrannized at Babylon. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God but to bring them into constant dependence upon his power. So early Babylonia, or Sumer, or Shinar, was peopled by two races in its first stages. There was the ebony-hued, dark-skinned Kushite blacks, whose men wore earrings, their hair was braided, and their face was always clean-shaven. And then you had the olive-skinned Semite Chaldeans who had a very distinct Near Eastern nose and most of the men wore very groomed big beards with a lot of facial hair. The Kushites held sway in its embryonic beginnings and they were led by a man called Nimrod who was turned into a hero god when Layard excavated the site in the 19th century, the Arabs were still calling Iraq, Assyria, the land of Nimrod, as termed by the 8th century BC and co-prophet of Isaiah, Micaiah. Nimrod set up the first world government, and when he thought that he was at the top of his game, God had to shut it down by confounding the languages on the earth. According to Genesis chapter 10, verses 8, 9 and 10, Nimrod set up his kingdom, Babylon, in the land of Shinar, or Sumer. 
that archaeology has proven as the cradle of civilization. But one man tried to revive his system of government. In Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the Neo-Babylonian Chaldean monarch, also set up a kingdom in the exact geographical location as Nimrod's, in the land of Shinar or Sumer. And when you go around museums in England, there are a number of artifacts that document Nebuchadnezzar's building projects. One of them is very interesting to look at. It is in the Ishtar Gate in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, Germany, and it is huge. And if you ever get an opportunity, pay it a visit. This man had skills. And guess what? Despite his paganism, God humbled him and Nebuchadnezzar secured his place in eternity, where his body now rests in the earth until the first resurrection. I wonder why blue was such a dominant colour on the artwork of Nebuchadnezzar's temples. In the Bible, blue represents the commandments of God. And in cultures in the east like Feng Shui, it is used as a calming colour. And studies have shown that blue is most people's favourite colour when surveys have been conducted from people all over the world. This is a miniature model of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And in order for his government to be run effectively, he wanted his administration to be led by men who were thoroughly trained in state affairs. When he invaded the kingdom of Jerusalem, he appointed men of Judah who were of noble stock, skillful in wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. And if you were to carefully look at the different artifacts from ancient Babylon in museums all over the world, you will see, as we have already covered, that men were highly skilled in science and math that included accountancy and banking. They measured by different weights and the priests and school lessons were very highly advanced. A group of young men by the name of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah went through three years of intense vigorous training that included the different sciences of astronomy, geography, geology, zoology, philology, history, maths and grammar that included the language of the Chaldees. And to use urban vernacular, they smashed it and came out 10 times better than the indigenous Chaldean priestly class. Why did these men excel in all their subjects? There is a reason. Continue to stay tuned and we'll find out more in this up and coming study on the book of Daniel.